The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is the biggest and most ambitious game Nintendo has ever produced. I've been a Zelda fan my entire life. I closely followed the development of this latest title ever since its announcement, and even I couldn't have expected the sheer scale of Tears of the Kingdom. The sequel to Breath of the Wild finally released around nine months ago, in May of 2023. So I've had the best part of a year to play my most anticipated release ever and to form my own opinions on it. And it's time to ask, is it any good? It took me some time to get my head around just what Breath of the Wild actually was. I'd been following its development for years, convinced that we were going to see a game somewhat similar to The Wind Waker or Twilight Princess, only set in the most expansive, freely explorable Hyrule to date. But when we saw the game's tutorial, The Great Plateau, demoed at E3 2016, it became clear just how far the developers had gone to break the series' conventions. This wasn't just the new Zelda game, it was something else entirely. I was somewhat disappointed by Breath of the Wild's complete lack of traditional Zelda elements at first. I didn't like that the bulk of the game's story takes place in the distant past, with Link's quest through the wilderness serving as something of an epilogue, a closing chapter to a narrative that the player really isn't present for. I didn't like the game's lack of traditional dungeons, items, or unique discoveries. And it wasn't until a few months after the game's release that my opinion changed. Suddenly, I understood what the developers were going for, what this game actually was. I put aside my preconceptions, and I began to fall in love with it. This version of Hyrule is the game's main feature, to the point where it takes pride of place in the game's subtitle. Other Zelda games are named after important items, narrative elements, or concepts, like Ocarina of Time, The Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, or Skyward Sword. But instead, Breath of the Wild's focus is on its world, the eponymous Wild Link is free to explore. And what a world to explore! A truly gigantic open space, with climates from scorching volcanic slopes or burning deserts to freezing tundras and tropical jungles. And across every inch of it, the world teases its own story, that of a terrible apocalypse a century ago that had brought Hyrule to its knees. Ruins of the kingdom that came before allow the player a window into Hyrule's past, a time of prosperity now crumbling into myth. Every part of Breath of the Wild is designed around exploring this world, from the fact that the game front-loads you with almost all of your main items and abilities right at the beginning, rather than spread across the adventure like in previous titles, to the way traditional Zelda dungeons have been broken up into the tiny, self-contained shrines. This game wasn't just the series' next step, it was a complete revolution, a leap dwarfing that taken by Ocarina of Time, the game which brought Zelda into the third dimension. Breath of the Wild fundamentally changed what it is to be a Zelda game, by focusing on the exploration of a highly detailed, realistic fantasy world at the cost of all else. And once I understood this, I saw the game for what it truly was, the definitive open world experience. Two years later, during E3 2019, Nintendo dropped the bombshell of all bombshells. A sequel to Breath of the Wild was in development. While the trailer showed the very same Hyrule we had explored in Breath of the Wild, it teased a much darker tone, featuring the mummified remains of Ganondorf, the Gerudo King who had become the monstrous Calamity Ganon faced in the first game. It was confirmation that Breath of the Wild's vivid story wasn't over yet. This Link and Zelda, some of the best written iterations in the series, 
were going to embark on another adventure. Around this time, interviews with the developers revealed that this as yet unnamed sequel was the result of the creation of downloadable content, or DLC, for Breath of the Wild. The game had received two expansion packs, the Master Trials and the Champion's Ballad, but the team weren't done. They had so many ideas for how to build upon the game, in fact, that they decided to instead begin work on a full sequel, an almost identical story to the creation of the critically acclaimed Super Mario Galaxy 2. And Eiji Aonuma, Zelda series producer, soon confirmed that this sequel would be reusing the overworld, as you'd expect for a game which began as DLC. Hype and speculation was everywhere. We were getting a full, immediate sequel to one of the biggest, most inventive games Nintendo had ever made. But there was also some trepidation around the developers' comments. The world itself is at the core of Breath of the Wild's identity. How were they going to reuse it in a way that felt fresh? How could the sequel to a game entirely about exploration recapture this feeling, if players will be inevitably retreading their own footsteps? The answer was revealed two years later. E3 2021 showed Breath of the Wild's sequel once more. This time with the reveal that the game wouldn't just include Hyrule's surface, but islands floating in the sky far above it. This was it. This was how they could give players, new and old, that feeling of exploring an uncharted world. There would be a whole new world above their heads. With each subsequent trailer, we learned more about this elusive sequel. Link would have a full set of entirely new abilities, brilliantly creative tools with which to explore this expanded world, including the ability to construct his own vehicles out of materials, bringing a whole new level to exploration in this world. The story would feature the Zonai, a forgotten civilization only hinted at in the first game by scattered, ancient ruins. By this point, theories were rampant. It felt like everyone was speculating on just what this game was going to be, how they were going to build on the foundation of Breath of the Wild, and where its story would take this incarnation of Link and Zelda. And then, the game was released. Surprising absolutely nobody, it received overwhelming critical acclaim, just like Breath of the Wild had before it, and Skyward Sword before that. The game shattered sales records, moving 10 million units in as little as three days, becoming the fastest selling Nintendo game ever in the United States. It's unarguably the biggest, most successful launch of any Legend of Zelda game in history, the absolute zenith of the series so far. Or so it seemed. While the general consensus around launch was that Tears of the Kingdom had lived up to, and even exceeded, the lofty expectations of the Zelda fanbase, over the following months, the cracks began to show. Tears of the Kingdom isn't perfect. While in many ways it represents the highest heights of the Zelda series so far, the game also stumbles into some of the lowest lows making it a confusing mix of brilliant and disappointing. It's taken me a long time to collect my thoughts on Tears of the Kingdom, because in so many ways, my opinion hasn't changed. I loved the game then, and I still love it today, and it's obvious why. But the game isn't flawless, and I feel that there were many decisions made by the Zelda team that held it back from true excellence. Blemishes which stain something which is otherwise so impressive. Of course, this is just one man's opinion. You'll probably feel differently to me, and I'd love to hear your own opinions on the topics I discuss in the comments. So let's break down the biggest Zelda of them all, and discuss what worked, and what didn't. Tears of the Kingdom, like its predecessor, is set in the Kingdom of Hyrule. An indeterminate amount of years have passed since the previous game, likely no more than five, 
and Hyrule has begun to heal from its wounds, to recover from the apocalyptic Great Calamity that had broken it. Children have been born and new settlements constructed, until the peace Link fought for is once again threatened by the emergence of poisonous gloom from deep below Hyrule Castle. Link and Zelda investigate together, and the source of the gloom is revealed to be the body of Ganondorf, the Demon King, a figure remembered only in Hyrule's most ancient myths, from a terrible conflict called the Imprisoning War shortly after the kingdom was founded. The seal holding Ganondorf breaks, the Master Sword is shattered, Link is mortally wounded, and a strange artifact transports Zelda to the distant past. Link recovers on the Great Sky Island, a gigantic floating landmass, one of many that has appeared in Hyrule skies since Ganondorf's awakening, an event known as the Upheaval. This new cataclysm also resulted in great chasms opening up like wounds in Hyrule's surface, leading down into the terrifying depths and in strange events plaguing Hyrule's main races. The Rito, Gorons, Zora, and Gerudo are each affected differently by the return of the Demon King. Link must once again journey through Hyrule, to find Shrines of Light to heal from Ganondorf's attack, to free the main races from their struggles, and to solve the mystery of Princess Zelda's disappearance, by recovering her memories of the time she spent in the distant past, before finally facing off against the ancient evil which has awoken beneath the kingdom. While Breath of the Wild was a game about loneliness, a single, amnesiac hero piecing together the story of the kingdom's fall, Tears of the Kingdom is a game about connections. Link must awaken a new generation of sages, and unite Hyrule against a common foe. The developers have claimed that their chosen theme was hands, and this can be seen all throughout the game. This difference is central to a lot of the creative decisions made by the Zelda team. Despite the overwhelming similarities to the prequel, much of the development of Tears of the Kingdom was apparently focused around a completely opposite principle. But despite this, Tears of the Kingdom is unarguably just a vastly expanded version of Breath of the Wild. Not just in that it reuses the game's overworld, but in the game's structure. Link once again wakes up on an isolated tutorial island and is guided by the spirit of an old king, once again journeys to more than a hundred shrines dotted all across the world to gain strength, once again unlocks a map of Hyrule by visiting Sheikah Towers, and once again collects fragmented memories from a distant time, cutscenes which serve as the game's main story before heading to Hyrule Castle to face Ganon. The game features most of the same characters, enemies, music, materials, armour and weaponry, and, most importantly, the same soul. The central tenet of Tears of the Kingdom can be distilled down to the same single word as its predecessor, freedom. Freedom is at the heart of everything. The entire experience is absolutely devoted to providing the player with as many options as possible, all the time. The developers took the concept of unbounded exploration that had been their design philosophy for Breath of the Wild, and turned it up to a billion. The very heart of what Tears of the Kingdom is can be summarised as simply as this.
When developing the very first Legend of Zelda game on the NES, series creator Shigeru Miyamoto described it as wanting players to have a miniature garden they could keep in their drawer, meaning their very own little fantasy universe which they could visit and explore as if it was as real as the world outside their window. Well, over 35 years later, Nintendo have finally done it. Tears of the Kingdom completely captures this dream of Miyamoto's, and provides the player with truly unrestricted access to a beautiful, expansive world. It says a lot about the game that it makes Breath of the Wild feel restrictive. This absolute lack of restriction is the reason for Tears of the Kingdom's excellence, but it's also the cause of many of its issues. Let's examine why. As it began development as DLC for Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom reuses the overworld of its predecessor. Hyrule has changed, however. Puzzles have transformed, new monsters have made it their home, and shrines appear in different locations. And, of course, Tears of the Kingdom doesn't just take place on the surface, there are the sky islands above it, and the ominous depths below. The world of Tears of the Kingdom is overwhelmingly gigantic, yet absolutely seamless. Link can dive from the highest island into a chasm and land in the depths, then journey through the darkness to the other side of the map, all without a loading screen. If Link's abilities are the toys, then Hyrule is the playground. It's the same magical overworld that made Breath of the Wild so special, made bigger and better. The first game saw Hyrule in a post-apocalyptic state, crumbling ruins slowly being consumed by the creeping growth of the wild. People were scarce, found in small clusters surrounding stables and towns, with only the odd traveller brave enough to face the open roads. In contrast, Tears of the Kingdom's world is much more alive. This world isn't on the brink of collapse, but beginning to thrive once more. Until the return of Ganondorf, that is. Most of the towns have been significantly improved since Breath of the Wild. Tarrytown has been expanded into the wide plain at the foot of Akala Citadel, and is now a bustling community hub. A fungal fashion fad has taken Hateno Village by storm, spearheaded by a new character, Cece, and Lurelin Village has been laid low by a band of pirates, which Link can defeat and begin efforts to rebuild. Like with Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom's characters have their own schedules. They perform different actions at different times of the day, a mechanic often used in the game's many side quests. And new groups have formed in recent times. The Monster Defense Crew, warriors who face off against evils that plague their kingdom, and the Zonai Survey Team, a group founded by Princess Zelda to investigate the ruins of the ancient Zonai. While Breath of the Wild was primarily about Link exploring a country which was only barely clinging to life, Tears of the Kingdom's world is far more vibrant, and it sells the idea that Hyrule is beginning to recover extremely well. Everyone comes together to unite against this new threat, and the efforts to understand the mysteries of the upheaval and the disappearance of Princess Zelda are believable responses to such tragedies. Tears of the Kingdom's overworld repurposes almost all of Breath of the Wild's points of interest, twisting them into something new and strange. The old man's cabin on the Great Plateau, for example, was a peaceful resting spot in the first game, but now has been claimed by the Yiga clan and is the site of a deadly ambush. Not only this, but the overworld is now littered with caves, the entrances to which were revealed by the upheaval. These were sorely missing in Breath of the Wild. They're such a seamless, natural expansion of the world that it's hard to imagine the game without them. Caves are fantastic. Each one has a unique layout, filled with treasure, 
enemies or a shrine. They force the player to leave the free, open space outside and confine them in narrow tunnels, restricting their ability to fight and to explore. But this restriction isn't bad, it's the point. The caves contrast so well with the world outside, each functioning as a mini-challenge to break up overworld exploration. Caves are the perfect showcase of the Ascend ability. If at any point you want to leave the claustrophobic tunnels, just jump through the ceiling, emerge on the surface, and get distracted by something else. But, of course, Tears of the Kingdom isn't just the surface. The Sky Islands were absolutely central to the game's advertising and promotional material. They're at the core of this game's visual and thematic identity, and in concept are absolutely incredible. A whole new world of scattered islands above the kingdom, distant clusters of mysterious ruins far above the ground, functioning as targets for the game's systems of exploration. There just aren't enough of them. Aside from the Great Sky Island, which is admittedly an incredibly well-designed, expansive, interesting area, the rest of Hyrule's skies are relatively sparsely populated. In fact, the vast majority of Sky Islands are absolutely tiny archipelagos, repeated again and again and again across the map. These are, admittedly, very fun, especially when travelling to and between them is a puzzle in itself. But they're too small, too few, and too repetitive to truly live up to the expectations set by the game's promotional material. The Sky Islands are Tears of the Kingdom, but in practice, they're a relatively insignificant part of the game itself. Many Sky Islands can be solved in just minutes. After leaving the Great Sky Island, the game never again captures that feeling of deeply exploring the floating ruins of a lost civilization. And that's such a shame. The atmosphere of the Sky Islands, if you'll pardon the pun, is absolutely stunning. The music is ambient and sad, stone ruins decaying in the golden sunlight. The Great Sky Island feels like a tease for something we never truly get to experience again. Nothing else in the game comes close to the brilliance of this opening section. I'd have loved to see much more content in the skies comparable to the Great Sky Island. Perhaps two or three or four more giant clusters, the ruins of other settlements or temples from the time of Hyrule's founding. And frustratingly, it seems that something like this was once the case. In an interview, game director Hidemaru Fujibayashi claimed that they had gotten carried away adding Sky Islands, adding one after another to test different gameplay concepts. It got to the point where they had so many that some game designers intervened, telling them that the skies had become too messy and too cluttered with their inclusion. So, it seems that there was something of an over-correction. There were once many islands, but this number was drastically reduced during development. We can even see an example of these cut sky islands in the E3 2021 trailer, here. Link uses Ascend while exploring a large cluster of islands somewhere above Tanagar Canyon, islands which don't exist in the final game. Obviously, I don't claim to be a game designer, and perhaps cutting out big chunks of the game's Sky Islands was the right call. But the end result does feel underwhelming. An incredibly cool concept that we just don't get to see enough of. The overworld has also been expanded below. The Depths is an entirely new map running underneath the surface a dark inversion of the terrain above. Entering the depths for the first time is like nothing I've ever felt before in a video game. 
diving into the Hyrule Field chasm, hearing that horn, and realizing I'd fallen into the new dark world. At first, the depths radiate such an overwhelming feeling of dread. Pure blackness reaching out in all directions, seemingly forever. Like the Sky Islands, the atmosphere of the depths is astounding. The music is deeply unsettling, and the pitch darkness choking the entire layer makes it one of the most terrifying areas in the Zelda series. Coupled with the fact that enemies down here are more powerful, strengthened by gloom, this means exploring the depths truly is a test of Link's courage. And how massive it is can't be understated. It's every bit as large as the surface world above it, essentially giving us a new, nightmarish version of Breath of the Wild. But just like the Sky Islands, the depths lack well, depth. Yes, it's as massive as Hyrule above, but it's nowhere close to the same level of intricacy. The depth is incredibly repetitive. Everywhere is the exact same biome, with the exact same Zonai ruins, the same enemies, the same music. Exploring the darkness is incredibly exciting at first, but the more you do so, the more you realize that you've already seen all there is to see. There are very few unique discoveries, and outside of farming materials like Zonite and the Yiga questline, which I'll cover later, the game really doesn't give enough of an incentive to explore this layer. While I think that the Sky Islands should have been bigger and more numerous, I feel that the depths could have benefited instead from being smaller. Rather than an entire dark world, with a small number of points of interest scattered across a gigantic open space, breaking the depths up into smaller pockets could have allowed for much more interesting designs. Perhaps different biomes, or more unique areas that can't be found elsewhere. Tears of the Kingdom's world is designed in a way that lets you experience the best the game has to offer however you play, and however much you play. This means that points of interest are repeated and scattered everywhere across the map, so that everyone will encounter what the developers want them to in a natural way just by following their own curiosity. This is why the game feels so unbelievably excellent in the first few hours. Everywhere you go, everything you do, there's something new and exciting and interesting waiting for you. But it's also why the game begins to sour and feel repetitive the more you explore. And I think that the depths exemplify this issue. It feels like the developers don't expect players to explore every inch of this netherworld, so they repeat the same points of interest over and over, to guarantee that every player encounters them. But despite these issues, it's worth taking a minute to appreciate the immersion achieved by Tears of the Kingdom's world. It won't be a surprise to anyone to hear that this has been absolutely perfected. This world feels real in every sense, from characters having their own lives to the sounds of nature. The sound design of Tears of the Kingdom is head and shoulders above anything else in the series. It was nearly flawless in its predecessor, but it's been improved even further. The developers made a conscious effort to create a soundscape that was even more immersive. Sound director Hajime Wakai commented, In The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, we tried to make nearby environmental sounds, such as bird calls, sound realistic. However, with this title, the expressiveness of these sounds have been improved to the point where players hear a bird call from afar and sense the distance more realistically. But it isn't just the bird calls and the sound of the wind, the music, too, has dramatically improved. 
Yes, the game's soundtrack does reuse many of Breath of the Wild's themes, especially those ambient tracks for exploring the wilderness, but it adds so many more, to the point where I consider Tears of the Kingdom as a contender for my favourite Zelda soundtrack out of them all. From the bombastic, orchestral themes of boss battles, like Demon King Ganondorf, to the quieter but no less beautiful themes scoring Link's exploration, like the skydiving theme, to ambient, melancholic tracks for points of interest, like the Hyrule Castle Chasm. It's almost not worth mentioning Zelda music in a review, Obviously, it's absolutely first class, and coupled with the enhanced environmental sounds and the game's stunning visual style, Tears of the Kingdom's world is incredibly easy to lose yourself in. Overall, Tears of the Kingdom's Hyrule is, by far, the greatest overworld we've ever gotten in a Zelda game, taking Breath of the Wilds, tripling it, and packing it with even more content. Every inch of this world is so intricately realised, every little nook and cranny has something to do, whether that's a monster camp to battle, a minigame or side quest, or just Addison needing help with holding up a sign. But the somewhat disappointing reality of the main additions, the Depths and Sky Islands, leaves the surface once again as the main course of this game, resulting in the game feeling incredibly similar to its predecessor. This version of Hyrule was at the core of the first game's identity. Everything about the game was engineered to focus on the world itself. Tears of the Kingdom doesn't do enough to differentiate from the first game. It feels like an encore, not a main act. Breath of the Wild is this Hyrule, so what does Tears of the Kingdom have as its identity? I think it's finally time to admit that it was a mistake to reuse Breath of the Wild's overworld here. For a game so hellbent on giving players the quintessential exploration experience, it doesn't give us enough to capture this feeling again, especially for those who've already played Breath of the Wild, already spent hundreds of hours exploring every corner of this world, which, considering the game sold over 30 million copies, is quite a few people. This is a feeling that was echoed by the Zelda team. Eiji Aonuma said in an interview that the word deja vu cropped up many times during development. We were supposed to be making something different, but the various things we made gave off a similar impression to what we'd done previously. Fujibayashi added, There were many instances, even later on in development, where we struggled to differentiate the two. It was a constant and difficult process where we and the development team continued to mull over and discuss until we all came to an agreement. And designer Satoru Takazawa added, We often experienced strong deja vu, especially in the early stages, and we thought it was imperative to transform how the game felt as much as we could. We worked hard with that thought in mind, but once we got to a certain point in development, we were able to identify areas that would lose their appeal if we changed them. While I agree that they did change enough that the game does feel different, for me at least, this feeling of deja vu remains. Breath of the Wild perfectly captured this feeling of exploring the unknown. So much of the beauty of these open-air Zelda games is the idea that you can go anywhere. Any distant mountain can be climbed, any vast canyon explored. The games are driven by the player's own desire to travel, to see new things, which is a feeling Tears of the Kingdom cannot recapture. This is made worse by the return of Korok Seed puzzles, 
one of the most iconic and divisive elements of Breath of the Wild. There are admittedly new types of puzzle, like the stranded Koroks who must be delivered to their friend in return for two seeds, but the fact that they return at all is somewhat disappointing. Breaking the game world up with microscopic puzzles like these is still a great idea, just as it was in the first game, but the fact that they return in an almost identical fashion doesn't help the game feel different to what came before. This is also the case for Tears of the Kingdom's items. Now, I expected the game's materials to carry over from the prequel. They're not going to invent new types of fruit or insects, for example, if this game is set in the very same world. However, almost every basic weapon, shield and bow, and nearly every armor set is also just recycled from Breath of the Wild. Hell, the reward for most of the chests found in the depths, located via old maps, are just items from the first game's amiibo gear. This is incredibly disappointing. Yes, Fuse does add a whole new layer to the weapons, and make even reused ones feel fresh, but there's no excuse for the armor. It's mostly just… the same. The game's catalogue of enemies, too, is incredibly similar to the previous title. Of course, almost every enemy has been changed to include a horn for Fuse, and this mechanic does completely change the way players interact with combat, for the better. But in terms of actual enemy variety, Tears of the Kingdom falls completely short. It reuses almost every enemy from the first game. In fact, it only adds Constructs, Gibdos, Likelikes, Evermeans, Erakuda, Horriblins and Little Frocks as base enemies, and Bosbacoblins, Flux Constructs, Frocks, Gleox and Phantom Ganon as overworld bosses. Everything else is just carried over from Breath of the Wild, from the lowly Bacoblins and Lazalfos to the mighty Hinox and Lynels. Of course, like with Breath of the Wilds, every enemy in this game is fantastically designed. It's clear just how much care and attention to detail went into designing every little thing about them, from their AI to their idle animations. It's just the lack of variety that stings, further tying the game to its predecessor, another way in which it failed to stand out as something new. I feel that a sequel to Breath of the Wild should have taken us instead to new lands, new terrain to explore, new secrets and history to uncover, new enemies to fight, and new items to fight with. Instead, as masterfully designed and technically impressive as the world is, and it is, this inescapable feeling of deja vu is one of the main factors holding the game back from true excellence. Tears of the Kingdom's theme of connections is represented by Link's right arm. Damaged by Ganondorf's gloom and restored by the spirit of King Raru in the prologue, Link's arm is his attachment to Hyrule's past, his connection to his new allies, and the source of his new powers. The main four of these are the replacements for Breath of the Wild's Sheikah Slate runes, unlocked in shrines on the Great Sky Island. First, and most important, is Ultra Hand a much more advanced version of Magnesis. This allows him to manipulate almost any object in his immediate environment, to pick it up, move it and rotate it, and even combine objects together to build whatever he wants. If the player wants to cross a great chasm, no problem. Simply cut down some trees, stick them together, and you've made a bridge. A lever is missing its handle, making it impossible to turn? Just glue something else on as a replacement. Ultra Hand represents Nintendo fully leaning into the sandbox elements introduced in Breath of the Wild, giving the player control of their surroundings in a way no Zelda game has done before. And, of course, the Ultra Hand ability allows him to build with Zonai devices. 
Zonai devices are individual pieces of ancient machinery. Fans, wheels, lights, rockets, bombs, cannons, gliders, all of which Link is able to manipulate freely with Ultra Hand, to glue pieces together and build whatever he wants. This allows him to construct anything, from battle bots to cars, helicopters to jet planes. The world is littered with devices, practically begging the player to cobble together some ingenious new way to traverse it. Ultra Hand's building system is a truly incredible feat of game design. The steering stick, another Zonai device, can be glued on to any of Link's homebrew vehicles to give him the ability to turn. The player can stick pieces together absolutely however they want, and the game engine will still understand exactly how it should function. This crafting system is the defining mechanic of Tears of the Kingdom. I just wish it was encouraged more. The Sky Islands, for example, are often separated by great distances of nothing but open air, setting the player the task of finding a way to cross this empty space. The answer, of course, is almost always immediately apparent. These islands are covered in Zonai devices, which can be combined into a vehicle to soar across the skies. This is the core of the mechanic, and it is fantastic. The layout of the environment presents a puzzle, and the solution lies in the building system. But these are very basic ways to use Ultra Hand. The usual answers to Tears of the Kingdom's vehicle puzzles are very simple. A glider with fans attached, or a floating platform propelled by rockets. The game never asks you to interact with the system in a deeper way, or build anything more complicated than the most basic vehicles. Adhering to the game's principle of absolute freedom, it feels like Tears of the Kingdom wants the player to get creative, but never pushes them to do so, instead hoping that they'll have fun simply through the process of seeing their wonderful contraptions come to life. For example, the player could build the flying machine of their dreams, combining fans and rockets with a glider to take to the skies in style. Or, they can instead glue two fans to a steering stick, building an uninspired, boring, but much more efficient machine. Ironically, Tears of the Kingdom is full of situations where being creative feels like a penalty. I desperately want to interact with the systems Nintendo have designed, but I don't feel like there's enough reason to. There's never a need to build something great like a battle mech or a fighter plane. You can, and they're great fun, but the rewards will never justify the resources spent. Never does this game require you to push Ultra Hands to its limit. Of course, many of Tears of the Kingdom's shrines do revolve entirely around Ultra Hand. I'll cover the shrines themselves in detail later on, but even the best of them feel like little more than an introduction to the mechanic in question. Not to say that they're bad, the Maya Chideg Shrine, for example, as you take on an army of constructs with your own force of Zonai battle bots, which is just brilliant. It's just that this is still quite a basic use of the mechanic. Truly exploring the depths of the Ultra Hand system feels extracurricular. Tears of the Kingdom relies on players wanting to mess around in the sandbox just for the sake of it. If they don't, then the real magic of Zonai devices is lost. Adding to this, another problem with vehicle building is that they're not permanent. Entering a shrine or traveling too far from your creation will cause it to despawn, as will certain enemy attacks. And that's not all. Many of the larger Zonai devices exist on a timer. After a certain amount of use, they'll vanish from beneath Link's feet. This transience seems to be at odds with how deep the game's building system really is. I don't want to spend time creating masterpieces that will inevitably just disappear. 
Of course, Link eventually unlocks Auto Build, the ability to save blueprints of his constructions in order to build them again quickly, but it's at the cost of more resources. This doesn't really help the issue, in fact, it makes it worse. Why build an extravagant but temporary machine out of many different, valuable parts when you can just build something simple and respawn it for less? The final problem I'll voice about Ultra Hand is again one that stems from the amount of freedom the game provides, that is, with the notable exception of Shrines, Link can access his Zonai device's inventory tab anywhere he wants. A simple vehicle as efficient as the hoverbike completely trivializes exploration, allowing the player to easily cross vast distances of land. Of course, this only becomes a problem later on in the game when Link has increased his battery meter or got his hands on enough Zonite charges to replenish it. This is done with Zonite, a material he can gather in the depths. On the surface, this is a good way to incrementally increase the potency of these tools as the player progresses through the game, but it ends up compounding Ultrahan's issues rather than fixing them. The battery meter means that vehicles are almost useless at the beginning of the game before quickly becoming incredibly overpowered as soon as Link begins to gather Zonite and charges. Before long, any challenge that involves traversing the environment is trivialized. Breath of the Wild forced the player to explore Hyrule's surface, to navigate its terrain and discover its secrets, but Tears of the Kingdom's vehicle system makes it far too easy to skip this vital gameplay loop. But perhaps most problematically, Zonai vehicles can be used in the game's dungeons. Both the Water Temple and the Fire Temple can be completely broken by a simple Zonai vehicle. Traversing these areas should be part of the puzzle, but Ultra Hand makes it a complete non-issue. Of course, as with anything in Tears of the Kingdom, you don't have to do this, but players shouldn't have to restrict themselves from using one of the game's main mechanics to their advantage in such an obvious way. Contrary to the design philosophy of the game itself, I'd argue that Ultra Hand's uses needed to be more curated and less free. More instances where the game directly required its use in specific, advanced ways, and less instances where it could be used to circumvent other challenges. It truly is one of the most intuitive, inventive systems I've seen in a video game. It works flawlessly and is a testament to the skill of the people making these games. It just feels that the system doesn't gel as well as it could with the game itself. And for players who don't enjoy the creative, sandbox elements of these games as much as they do other aspects, then Ultra Hand leaves something to be desired. Fuse works similarly to Ultra Hand, but for Link's own weapons rather than objects. With Fuse, any material is a potential weapon part or arrowhead. This feels like a direct response to two of Breath of the Wild's main issues, the weapon durability and the uselessness of many of its vast library of collectible materials. In that game, I often found myself avoiding conflict with groups of enemies, simply because I knew that the fight would damage or break my weapon, and that I likely wouldn't get something of comparable or greater value in return. Fuse means almost every enemy is worth defeating. Most have been given new horns, which can be attached to weapons or arrowheads for increased damage. It could be argued that this still hasn't solved the issue of weapon durability. It is still disheartening to see your best weapons smashed to smithereens on contact with a Bokoblin's skull, but it greatly tips the balance in favour of actually engaging with enemies, and makes encounters far more exciting and worthwhile. 
The ability to fuse materials to arrows, too, gives use to so many of them. Attaching eyeballs will give the arrow an unnatural kind of sight, allowing it to home in on its targets, and wings will greatly increase their speed and distance. Naturally, Tears of the Kingdom does away with the elemental weapons and arrows of the previous game, instead asking the player to fuse elemental materials, like chew jellies or gemstones, to their equipment for the desired effect. Fuse does unfortunately suffer from Tears of the Kingdom's somewhat clunky UI. Fusing materials to arrows involves stopping the game to select a material from a slider, and fusing materials to weapons or shields often involves opening the inventory and dropping them on the ground first. These both feel like oversights that hinder a system that is otherwise close to perfect. It seems strange that arrow fusion doesn't allow the player to set defaults, for example, to prevent the need to open the menu every time, or that Link isn't able to fuse materials to his weapons directly from the inventory screen. These setbacks don't completely spoil the fusibility, though, far from it, but I'd have hoped for such a central mechanic to be integrated in a much smoother way. Ascend allows him to jump through almost any ceiling and emerge on the other side, completely changing the way vertical movement works in any area with built-up terrain. This is an absolutely ingenious way to continue the player's freedom even in tight, claustrophobic caves. At any time, Link can just jump through the ceiling to exit. Ascend works flawlessly, not just as a way to move around the world, but as a get-out-of-jail-free card for tight spaces. It feels so natural that I often find myself forgetting that I can't use it in real life, or in other games I play. It's the least extravagant of Link's new abilities, but it's the one I want to see return in a future game the most. The final main ability is Recall, which lets him reverse the flow of time for certain objects. Some of these are predetermined events, like riding fallen rocks back up to the Sky Islands, but others are completely organic. Constantly, the game is keeping track of the location and history of the objects surrounding Link, allowing him to reverse the momentum of nearby objects, enemy projectiles, even his own Ultra Hand creations. It goes without saying that this is one of the most technically impressive aspects of Tears of the Kingdom. It is genuinely unbelievable that this system works so well. Dropped your brand new vehicle off of a Sky Island? Doesn't matter, just rewind it. Want to create a floating platform to reach a higher area? Just move it with Ultra Hand, hop on, and play the movement in reverse. Recall also has some significant involvement in the game's story, which we'll cover later, but overall is an expertly designed, genius tool in Link's arsenal. Link's new abilities are quintessential Nintendo. They're weird, quirky, and absolutely brilliant. The way Link controls in Tears of the Kingdom is unlike anything else, and really is an example of Nintendo's absolute mastery of game design. The game feeling as open and free as it does is largely due to Link himself. His abilities are incredibly powerful, and all are designed to allow unlimited exploration. And there are more. Just like in Breath of the Wild, Link gains another set of powers as he progresses through the main quest, abilities granted to him by the newly awakened Sages. In the first game, the spirits of the champions each granted you their signature ability, which could be toggled on or off in the Key Items tab of the inventory screen. These abilities were seamlessly integrated into Link's controls, if he holds the jump button, he'll activate Revali's Gale. If he's killed, Mipha's Grace will automatically revive him. Tears of the Kingdom instead features Sage Avatars, spiritual doppelgangers of the Sages who will follow Link around, and even fight enemies alongside him. 
This is very fitting for the game's overarching theme of connections, of bringing Hyrule together to fight against a common foe. And it is very satisfying, especially near the end of the game, in the Horde battle against Ganondorf's army. It's a very tangible way to mark Link's progress. The more people he helps, the more friends he has to fight by his side. Because of this, the Sage's abilities are activated by the avatars themselves. Tulin can summon a gust of wind, primarily useful for boosting Link while he glides, sort of like a horizontal version of Rivali's Gale. Yonobo can curl himself into a ball and smash into a target, which can be used for mining rocks or as a powerful attack in combat. Sidon will summon a protective bubble of water around Link, which can absorb a hit, cool him in hot areas, or be sent forth by attacking. Riju can call down a powerful lightning strike, which can be easily guided by one of Link's arrows for explosive damage. And Minoru offers her construct itself, which Link can ride to take control, as well as kit out with various Zonai devices like cannons or shock emitters, useful in both combat and for mining. While the Sages do offer a great variety of powerful abilities, the way they are integrated into Link's moveset does leave a little to be desired. Link needs to be close to one in order for their ability to become available to him. This works fine for Tulin, who always flies close to Link while paragliding, where his ability is most useful, but less well for the others. It can feel awkward to get close enough to trigger a Sage's ability, especially with multiple Sages summoned at once, or in the midst of a chaotic battle. While I appreciate the symbolism of having the paragons of Hyrule's races by your side, Tears of the Kingdom's Sages system does feel quite clunky, nowhere near as fluid as the champion's abilities that came before. I found myself playing with the Sages deactivated for the majority of my adventure, with the notable exception of Tulin, whose expert archery skills and boosts to Link's gliding speed are invaluable. But even with these minor gripes, Tears of the Kingdom's Link stands well above any other version of the hero in the series. He feels the most satisfying to control, he has the most options and abilities, and is by far the most powerful. He is an absolute joy to play as, the perfect avatar with which to explore one of the most expansive worlds in gaming. But of course, what good is a powerful hero if he's never tested? Let's talk about the game's dungeons. Part of Breath of the Wild's quest to break free of Zelda conventions involved dismantling the idea of traditional dungeons. Every 3D Zelda game before it had these, labyrinths, each with their own unique visual and musical themes, their own bosses, and their own connections to the game's story, often closely associated with the area they're found in, or the people who live nearby. Zelda dungeons are part of the series' identity, a darkness that contrasts with the bright overworlds above, trials that Link must use his courage to overcome. These are often the best parts of Zelda games, the Forest Temple in Ocarina of Time, the Sand Ship in Skyward Sword, the Arbiter's Grounds in Twilight Princess. Zelda dungeons mark your progress through the game, testing your abilities in both combat and puzzle solving, and rewarding you with items and story progression for your trouble. Breath of the Wild took the idea of classic dungeons and ripped them apart, breaking them down into smaller chunks, scattered all throughout the overworld in the form of Sheikah Shrines of Trials. Each of these presents a miniature challenge, comparable in scale to a room or two from a more traditional Zelda dungeon, and each rewards Link with some treasure, as well as a spirit orb with which he can increase his stamina or heart containers. I'll go on record saying that I actually love shrines. I really adore these tiny puzzle boxes, challenges that offer a break from overworld exploration for a few minutes at a time. 
Some of Breath of the Wilds left a little to be desired, but others were truly excellent mini dungeons, proof that this concept could work. My main issue with the Sheikah Shrines sounds nitpicky, but it really is a problem. They're all identical. They're all themed after the technology of the Sheikah who built them. Every single one is an underground chamber lit with alien blue light, with a mummified monk waiting at the end in a stasis cube. A huge part of the charm of Zelda dungeons is their unique themes, piecing together the story implied by their design, wondering about the rich history of these ancient sites. Dungeons are themed after different elements, with different music, enemies, puzzles, items, and boss battles. Variety is the key here, and it's what was missing from Breath of the Wild's redesigned dungeons. While they do often present very well-designed challenges, the monotony means that they fail to recapture the same magic of the dungeons of old. Of course, they weren't the only dungeons in Breath of the Wild. The game also featured the four divine beasts, gigantic machines poisoned by the Calamity Ganon turned against the people they were designed to protect. These four fill the role of the game's main dungeons, and in concept are incredibly cool, but again they falter like the shrines. They're also all themed exactly the same, built in the distant past by the ancient Sheikah, and all have different versions of the same boss at the end. In fact, the problem is worse here. The Divine Beasts are incredibly formulaic. Meet with a descendant of a champion, subdue the beast and enter it, activate terminals, then defeat the Blight. None of them are bad or unfun by any means, but they don't quite scratch that dungeon itch. So how does Tears of the Kingdom change things? Not much. Shrines return in the sequel, though now they're known as Shrines of Light rather than Shrines of Trials. And instead of being designed as a test for Link by the ancient Sheikah tribe and their advanced technology, these were designed by the ancient Zonai using their advanced technology. They were built by King Raru and Queen Sonia in the distant past to purify evil magic. Like Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom features well over a hundred of these shrines, scattered all across the overworld and the skies above. The depths instead feature light roots in their place, found directly below surface shrines, offering a fast travel point and a small bubble of relief from the oppressive darkness. Many shrines are incredibly creative mini-challenges, making use of the game's mechanics in unique, satisfying ways, and tasking the player with showing their mastery of the abilities that have been introduced to them. When Tears of the Kingdom's shrines are at their best, they're brilliant, and just wanting to see what challenge awaited me was enough to make me excited every time I saw a glowing spiral in the distance. However, this isn't the case for all of them. A solid chunk of them are simply tutorials for specific game mechanics or Zonai devices, and another chunk more are just blessing shrines, those that offer no challenge, only rewards. Blessing shrines make sense if the puzzle itself exists in the overworld, like delivering a Zonai stone to the correct place, but a few very easily reached shrines are inexplicably blessings, offering absolutely no challenge to the player whatsoever. And unfortunately, Shrines of Light suffer from the same problem as Sheikah Shrines, in that they're incredibly monotonous. Again, the interior of every shrine is themed exactly the same. They're all made of the same, admittedly gorgeous, stone, they're all filled with the same construct enemies, and they all end with the same statues. There's no variety whatsoever. Yes, some shrines experiment with different elements and different types of puzzle, but they're all so similar. And Tears of the Kingdom's emphasis on freedom causes a new problem. Many of the game's shrines are incredibly easy to cheat, or to break entirely. 
Link is so powerful and has so many options that the average difficulty of shrines in this game feels significantly lower than it was in the prequel. For example, bridging the sands involves an orb starting close to Link before being launched all the way across a vast room of flowing quicksand. The shrine offers you the materials to build a craft to cross the sand and retrieve the orb from the other side, where it's guarded in a little fort by constructs. In concept, this is a wonderful little challenge, except for the fact that Link has recall and can just rewind the orb's trajectory back to the start, skipping the whole thing. This ability to solve puzzles in any way you want is very exciting at first. Coming up with unique ways to complete shrines makes you feel like a genius, but only at the beginning of the game. By the end, the challenges presented by them felt so trivial that I was desperate for something more difficult, puzzles that were curated and less easy to break. The major exceptions to my criticism of Tears of the Kingdom's shrines are the Proving Grounds. Shrines which strip Link of all items and equipment upon entry, forcing him to sneak, scavenge, and think on his feet. These functionally replace the Test of Strength shrines from Breath of the Wild, but there's really no comparison. While the former are monotonous and tiresome, these are utterly fantastic, and are yet another example of Tears of the Kingdom truly shining when absolute freedom isn't allowed. Restrictions force the player to get creative. Proving Ground Shrines ensure that the player can only use whatever tools can be found in the shrine itself, and as a result, they're much more difficult than the others and much better for it. These were some of my favourite parts of Tears of the Kingdom, challenged with using Link's abilities to face seemingly impossible odds. There are only 13 of these shrines in the game, however, less than a tenth of the total shrine count, and I wish there were far more of them. But like with Breath of the Wild, shrines aren't the only dungeons in the game. Tears of the Kingdom features elemental temples related to the game's main races, each with their own individual themes and unique bosses. These are the Wind, Fire, Water, Lightning, and Spirit Temples, toted as a return to the classic dungeons of old. Clearly, the Zelda team was happy with the result. In a recent interview, Eiji Aonuma stated that their intention was to put a bit more density or thoughtfulness into the design of the dungeons in the game. I mean, when we think of Breath of the Wild, one of our guiding principles was to rethink the conventions of the series, and that applied to thinking about dungeons as well. So we kind of broke apart our previous assumptions about the way we've made dungeons so far with that game. And I think the result was a simpler approach that you saw in dungeons in that game. But then we did hear the desire from fans for a bit more of a designed dungeon, and that led to our approach to dungeons for Tears of the Kingdom. And so, as we proceed, whenever we're making a game, we look back at our past and then we consider where we are now, the freedom that we give to players in these games. So, did they succeed in providing old school, bigger, and more challenging dungeons? Yes and no. Players can of course solve Hyrule's regional phenomena quests in whichever order they like, but the game definitely pushes you first towards Hebra, where Rito Village shivers in an endless blizzard. The snowstorm prevents supplies from reaching the settlement, leaving the Rito starving and freezing alone in the cold. The source of the blizzard is revealed to be high up in the sky above Hebra Peak. The Stormwind Ark has returned, a flying ship built by the Zonai, recorded only in the oldest Rito legends. This ship is the Wind Temple, one of the game's five main dungeons, but even the act of reaching it is a challenge in itself. Tulin, the son of Tabor, joins Link on his journey skyward, into the Eye of the Storm. 
Higher and higher they climb along the rising island chain, as the music builds and the storm intensifies. A flash of lightning reveals the silhouette of the Ark. The legend is real. As they climb, a voice sounds out from the heavens, beckoning Tulin onwards to come to him. The atmosphere of the Wind Temple is Tears of the Kingdom at its very best. In fact, this entire questline is peak Zelda for me. This is exactly the right balance of story and gameplay, an ascent into the unknown. There's just enough backstory to the arc to make you feel like you're actually climbing into myth, the mountains falling away far below your feet until you see it. Link dives into the eye of the storm and boards the Stormwind Ark. Tears of the Kingdom's Wind Temple. Something below a sealed grate in the middle of the main deck is the source of the Hebra Blizzard, but the mechanisms to open it are stuck. Link and Tulin must therefore find and activate five terminals to unlock it, found in different parts of the ship, which Link can do in any order. The dungeon itself is very small, and the puzzles are very simple, but this is the dungeon players are pushed towards first, and it works really well as an introduction. Its boss, Kolgara, is the perfect crescendo to the Rito storyline, one of the most cinematic boss fights in any Zelda game. While the fight isn't particularly difficult, like the Ark itself, it's designed to be the first real boss players face, and it does its job perfectly. Its design, its theme music, and the sheer wow factor of fighting something while free-falling through a snowstorm is enough to place Kolgara among my favourite boss battles in the whole series. It's truly majestic, and I'll never forget the feeling when I first heard the Dragon Roost Island theme play. The next region players are pushed towards, though again not forced, is Eldin, Death Mountain, the Gorons and ancient Gorondia, the Fire Temple. Link's companion this time is Yonobo, same as in Breath of the Wild. However, he's not himself. He'd apparently met with Princess Zelda recently, and now wears a sinister mask which controls his mind. Yonobo has introduced a new type of delicacy on Death Mountain, marbled rock roast, an incredibly addictive substance that lulls Gorons into a zombie-like state, literally turning them into stoners. Once Link frees Yonobo from his possession, the pair travel to the peak of Death Mountain to find Zelda, but are instead attacked by Moragia. This boss fight is an incredible spectacle. Link and Yonobo must fly a Zonai plane around the volcano's summit, using the Goron's signature technique to take down each of the monster's three heads. It feels like fighting Dark Beast Ganon in Breath of the Wild, but that's not a compliment. Miragia is so little of a threat that it really can't be called a boss fight. Still, it's a great visual, and defeating it opens the way to the Depths, and to Gorondia, once the Zonai built home of the Gorons, but also the Fire Temple used by the ancient Sage of Fire. Compared to the story of the Rito dungeon, Gorondia is sorely lacking. There's a Goron child near the city who talks about it, but discovering it evokes none of the majesty or wonder that surrounded finding the Stormwind Ark. And as a dungeon itself, it's good. The Fire Temple makes heavy use of minecarts, with Link having to switch tracks to navigate through the dungeon. At first, it can seem quite complicated and overwhelming, but it does have a good flow to it, definitely placing it as one of the better dungeons in the game. Unless you skip everything with the hoverbike, that is. Prince Sidon of the Zora helps Link uncover the source of the toxic sludge raining down on his domain, revealed to be the Water Temple, an ancient Zonai water purification site floating in the sky, 
now corrupted by the presence of Ganondorf's magic. In order to access the temple, though, Link needs to first uncover the myths surrounding it. Traveling to the ancient Zora waterworks below the East Reservoir Lake, which opens a waterfall leading to the Wellspring Islands. This section is pretty good. The low gravity of the islands make for a fun change of pace, allowing for some great puzzles and interesting combat encounters. The Zora quest is certainly better than the Gorons, but doesn't quite recreate that same brilliance of the Ritos. Unfortunately, any goodwill I had towards Sidon's adventure is lost immediately afterwards, once Link reaches the dungeon itself. The Water Temple might just be the single worst 3D dungeon in any game. Uncharacteristically for a Water Temple, it's so short and so incredibly easy that it's quite hard to believe it made it into the final game. It feels like a beta or a proof of concept rather than a true Zelda dungeon. There really isn't anything to even compare this to. No dungeon in the series has ever been this pathetically tiny. Some shrines are bigger and more involved than this. The temple consists of five miniature puzzles scattered around a handful of tiny floating islands, each very simple. There are no difficult combat encounters, no instances where the player has to actually think, and the only redeeming feature is the music, which, as you'd expect for Tears of the Kingdom, is absolutely outstanding. Activating the five water faucets activates the boss fight against the source of the sludge, Mukturok, by far the least exciting boss battle in the game. In concept, the idea of a pathetic, weak monster using powerful magic to summon toxic sludge sharks is great, but in practice, it's tedious and underwhelming. But the game redeems itself with the Lightning Temple, an ancient Zonai pyramid buried in the western Gerudo Desert, and the nesting place of Queen Gibdo, an insectoid creation of Ganondorf which has shrouded the Gerudo's home in a perpetual sandstorm, and infected it with hives from which the undead crawl out, and shuffle eerily into the desert. Link finds the Gerudo in peril, as Gibdos threaten the desert settlements, the Karakara Bazaar, and Gerudo Town itself. This is a brilliant sequence, probably second only to the build-up to the Wind Temple. Link must help Riju defend her people against the hordes of the undead. The first defense is very small and very easy, but the second is much grander. Link must choose where to place Gerudo soldiers, barricades, and artillery, before joining the battle himself. Following this, he must uncover the source of the undead nightmare, eventually leading him to the mural's myth, the Gerudo Dungeon itself. The Lightning Temple is, by far, the best designed dungeon in Tears of the Kingdom, and the closest to recapturing the magic of those in older Zelda games. Again, like with many other things in this game, it's the restrictions placed upon you by the temple that make it so great. Much of it involves exploring tight, dark tunnels and chambers which limit Link's abilities, and the puzzles presented are relatively challenging. The boss, too, is one of the tougher fights in the game. Queen Gibdo hits hard and spawns groups of Gibdos that chase you around her arena. Overall, the Lightning Temple is a brilliant dungeon, and I'd have loved the others to have been more similar to this rather than entirely open. One of my only complaints would be that it's still a little on the short side. It's a tease of something we really don't see enough of in the game. But even still, it suffers from the same big problem as the rest. As soon as the player begins their second regional phenomena quest, they realized that their first wasn't a unique experience. 
every single one of them follows the exact same formula. Link meets with the descendant of an ancient sage and begins to investigate ways to subdue the phenomenon. As they do so, the sage will call out to them, asking their descendant to come to them in their temple. Link and his companion then explore the temple and use their ability to activate a set number of terminals which will unlock the dungeon's boss. Once defeated, the descendant will meet their ancestor, each of whom will relay the exact same cutscene in almost exactly the same way. A great evil. A great the demon evil. The demon. 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 To which their companion will react in, you guessed it, the same way. That's the imprisoning war. It's quite hard to believe that this made it into the final game. Breath of the Wild's Divine Beasts were formulaic, yes, but at least they each ended with a unique, personal conversation with the spirits of the champions, characters who the player has come to know and understand. I'll cover them more in the story section of this review, but the ancient sages are completely absent of any character at all. We're never told anything about them, not even their names, and they all repeat the exact same dialogue almost verbatim at the end of their respective dungeons. I know that games like Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask could be accused of this too. The cutscenes in the Chamber of Sages or when meeting the Four Giants are all very similar, but not as similar as this. How we were no match for his overwhelming power. Even my strongest would not stop his the lightning all four main elemental dungeons end with almost exactly the same clip of the imprisoning war, and exactly the same reactions from the new sages. Demon King. Secret Stone? Secret Stone? Making completing them incredibly boring and predictable. Which isn't great when the imprisoning war itself and the events in the distant past are the game's central mystery. Instead of four unique glimpses into this ancient past, giving us different stories and different viewpoints of this forgotten history, we're given the same thing again and again. Of course, Tears of the Kingdom also features a fifth dungeon, the Spirit Temple, found in the depths of the Farren region. In truth, the Spirit Temple itself isn't really a dungeon, it's just the site of a boss battle. The actual puzzle solving takes place in the Construct Factory nearby, where Link must build a new body for the Spirit of Minoru. Like the other temples, the music and atmosphere of the Spirit Temple is exemplary, and I'd argue that the puzzles themselves, moving various parts of the constructs from their depots to the central area, are really great. My main complaint here is that it's just too short. For the dungeon that players will encounter last in their adventure, I'd expect more of a challenge, a culmination of everything they've learned through the game. Instead, the Spirit Temple is four puzzles, a journey across the monster-infested depths, and an admittedly awesome mirror match boss battle against the seized construct. Unlike the four main dungeons, the Spirit Temple ends with a much longer, more detailed recounting of the imprisoning war, told by Minoru. This is perhaps the best cutscene in the game, showing the climax of the conflict and Ganondorf's imprisonment at the hands of Roru. But I can't help but feel, if this exists, why even bother with the other Four Sages cutscenes? Why show us four identical, limited glimpses of this battle if Minoru's cutscene shows the entire thing later on? To me, it seems that it would have been more effective for each ancient sage to have explained something relevant to them, perhaps a story of how their people had struggled against the Demon King, a chance to explore something personal to them and their connections to their descendants. Instead, the meetings with the sages only make the temples feel more repetitive and soulless, which is one of the most glaring weaknesses of the game's dungeons. 
I do have to give the game credit for vastly improving the quests surrounding the main dungeons. Breath of the Wild's Divine Beasts were all accessed after a small regional quest too, but these were far shorter than their counterparts in Tears of the Kingdom, often little more than some short cutscenes and a battle with the Divine Beast itself. In comparison, Tears of the Kingdom's regional phenomena are much deeper, more rounded quests giving more context to the struggles of Hyrule's races. They're head and shoulders above what came before, but they don't do enough to completely absolve Tears of the Kingdom's dungeons of their issues. One of my gripes with the Divine Beasts as dungeons was that they all felt very similar. They all featured the same ancient Sheikah design, the same enemies, and were solved in the same way, by activating terminals. And every one of these problems has been carried over into these new temples. They were all built by the Zonai, they're all populated by constructs, and they're all solved again by activating a set of terminals. While I do appreciate the effort that went into giving each of them a unique quest, theme, and boss, they don't solve any of the actual issues Breath of the Wild had with its dungeons. Again, there are glimpses of something brilliant here. The build-up to and the atmosphere of the Wind Temple, or the intricate light puzzles of the Lightning Temple, show what Tears of the Kingdom's dungeons could have been. But they're just not enough. They're too repetitive, too short, and too simple. They're not classic Zelda dungeons. They're divine beasts in disguise. From the game's very first teaser trailer, I was excited for one thing above all else. Tears of the Kingdom's story and world building. Zelda stories are at the heart of why this series is so beloved and so successful. The Wind Waker, Skyward Sword, Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess. So many of these games have truly incredible stories to support and contextualize Link's adventure. Gripping, meaningful narratives full of emotion, twists, and set pieces. Unsurprisingly, Breath of the Wild's story broke the mold, and was instead a true post-apocalypse. The core of the game's narrative surrounds the collapse of Hyrule a century earlier, and for much of the game, Link is piecing together a story that has already happened. Tears of the Kingdom, though, was going to be a direct sequel. This game could build on the solid, deep world and lore established by its predecessor, and give us a traditional Zelda story set in the most realistic, believable Hyrule yet. Right? As a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, the story of Tears of the Kingdom begins a few years after the defeat of Calamity Ganon. During this time, Princess Zelda has begun to rebuild her kingdom. With the help of Hudson Construction, she oversees the building of new homes, settlements, and a school for Hyrule's children. The peace is broken, however, when an insidious substance known as Gloom begins to seep out from beneath Hyrule Castle, poisoning any who come into contact with it. An ancient staircase is discovered leading deep into the castle's foundations, and Zelda decides to investigate, accompanied, as always, by her chosen knight, Link. The pair journey deep into the bowels of Hyrule Castle, where they eventually discover ancient stonework and statues built by the Zonai, a civilization mentioned in Hyrule's earliest records. In a large chamber, they find a set of murals, which appear to depict the founding of the Kingdom of Hyrule and the imprisoning war that followed shortly afterwards. These murals aren't only meant to immortalize history though, they also serve as a warning. The source of the gloom is found in the next chamber, none other than the body of Ganondorf himself, the demon king who had waged war in Hyrule's first days who has been imprisoned here for thousands of years. As soon as Link and Zelda get close, the seal breaks. The spirit hand holding the Demon King lets him go, dropping a mysterious stone as it does so. Zelda picks the stone up, 
But before she can examine it, Ganondorf awakens. Though his body is withered, his power is overwhelming. With a surge of gloom, Ganondorf breaks the Master Sword and cripples Link's right arm. Another eruption of dark magic collapses the cave, Ganondorf falls into the darkness below, and Zelda falls with him. Though his arm is horrifically scarred, Link leaps after her and misses. Just as it seems like the princess will die, the stone she had picked up begins to glow, and she vanishes, having been transported to the distant past. Link is caught by the hand that had sealed Ganondorf and hauled into the heavens, where he awakens on the Great Sky Island. He soon discovers that Hyrule has changed. The events that followed Ganondorf's resurrection have become known as the Upheaval. Floating islands covered in Zonai ruins have appeared in the skies all across Hyrule, and ancient stonework has rained down on the kingdom below them. Chasms leading down into the depths have torn apart Hyrule's surface, and Hyrule Castle itself now floats, ominously, above its own chasm. Monsters have returned in force to terrorize the kingdom's people, and Hyrule's main races are each affected by their own regional phenomena. Strange glyphs have appeared on Hyrule's surface, glowing shapes that can only be seen from high above. But most troubling of all, Princess Zelda is missing. The spirit of Raru, the first king of Hyrule, tells Link that it was his hand that had sealed Ganondorf, and that he has managed to save Link's right arm by fusing it with his own. Link has been severely weakened by the attack, however. His blade has been broken, and his body ravaged by the gloom. In order to restore his lost vitality, he must bathe himself in the sacred light of the Zonai Shrines, each purging some of the darkness that remains within him and restoring power to his right arm. After obtaining the Ultra Hand, Fuse, and Ascend abilities, he can access the Zonai Temple of Time, where he meets with a ghostly projection of Zelda. Wordlessly, the princess reaches out and grants him the Recall ability, which, after the fourth tutorial shrine, Link uses to send the broken Master Sword back in time. With that, Link is set free into Hyrule once again, to uncover the truth of Zelda's disappearance, to free the four races from their plights, and to defeat the newly awakened Ganondorf. Like with Breath of the Wild, most of Tears of the Kingdom's story takes place in the past. The present is very static. There are, of course, a ton of characterful side quests, the main regional phenomena quests, and the main battle against Ganondorf himself, but that's it. All of the context for the game's events, anything actually interesting, is locked in the past, experienced not by Link, the player, but Zelda through cutscenes. Link can uncover Zelda's story with the geoglyphs on Hyrule's surface, each of which contains a dragon's tear, which, by interacting with Link's recall ability, will unlock a cutscene showing part of her journey in the distant past. Tears of the Kingdom's story is the story of Princess Zelda. After being transported from deep below the castle, she finds herself out in the open air, in the kingdom of Hyrule, but not the Hyrule she knows. She meets Raru and Sonya, who introduce themselves as Hyrule's king and queen, and invite her to stay with them at the castle. These are Hyrule's first rulers, the couple that began the royal family, making Zelda their distant descendant. The powers within her bloodline began with these two. King Raru holds the power of light, a power that can repel or destroy evil, which is implied to be the reason for Zelda's sealing power used to defeat the Calamity. And Queen Sonya holds power over time, and she can manipulate its flow. The reason Zelda travelled back here was because she picked up Raru's Secret Stone, a Zonai artifact designed to amplify the abilities of whoever wields it. 
This particular stone originally amplified Raru's light powers and helped him to keep Ganondorf imprisoned, but once picked up by Zelda, it began to amplify her own time powers inherited from Sonya. And so, when faced with a certain death, it was Zelda's own power that saved her and transported her to the distant past. Zelda is faced with an impossible challenge to return to the present, where she knows that a terrible threat has awakened, and Link is injured. But she doesn't yet know how to control her powers. She's trapped here, and the past isn't any safer than the present. Zelda has travelled back to the earliest days of the imprisoning war that was marked on the stone murals. Ganondorf, the king of the Gerudo tribe, aims to take control of the land from Raru, and rule Hyrule himself. Throughout the memories, we see Zelda train her time powers, in hope that she will be able to use them to return home. She spends time with the royal couple, as well as Minoru, the king's sister. Though she is trapped in this time against her will, she falls in love with these characters. Zelda lost her mother when she was only six years old, and her father, King Rome, died during the Great Calamity. So, in essence, King Raru and Queen Sonya fill this parental role. They are her own blood, and they care for her like she is their child. Though she is thousands of years removed from her own time, the past becomes a second home. And so, when the imprisoning war breaks out, Zelda is as affected by it as anyone else. She is appointed the Sage of Time by Raru, who gives out Zonai secret stones to the leaders of Hyrule's main races, and faces the Demon King alongside them. After the final battle, the one the player will see five times in cutscenes following the main dungeons, Zelda is at a loss. Raru is gone, Minoru is wounded, and Zelda is still stuck in the past, desperate to find her purpose here, and a way to get home. And then, a golden light appears just outside of the Temple of Time, and from it, the broken Master Sword appears. Through Zelda's time powers, Link's recall power, or a combination of the two, the Master Sword was able to travel back into the distant past, into Zelda's hands. With this, she understands. It had been her own powers that had caused her to travel to the past, and now she knows why. She must play a critical role in the battle against the Demon King, and deliver her knight the weapon which could undo him. She must bathe the Master Sword in her own light power, to restore it, and to imbue it with enough sacred force to repel Ganondorf. But, like Minoru had said, there was only one way to live long enough to see the present day, the forbidden act of Draconification. Zelda's sacrifice is Tears of the Kingdom's defining moment, and it's one of the most impactful story beats in the series. Although she's using an artifact created by the godlike Zonai for a good reason, it feels… wrong. Zelda's reaction to swallowing the stone is heartbreaking. She's giving up her autonomy, her life, her soul in order to save her kingdom. Her final words are spoken to Link, but they describe her own motivations. She is Hyrule's princess, and she is willing to give everything to protect her people. The Light Dragon is visible right from the beginning of Link's adventure. It circles the Great Sky Island during the tutorial, and breaks the cloud barrier obscuring the surface. It's been here, high above the clouds, for thousands upon thousands of years. Zelda has watched over the entirety of this Hyrule's history silently waiting for the time she knows as the present, and for her chosen knight. This makes Tears of the Kingdom's Master Sword pull one of the very best in the whole Zelda series. This is always among the most defining moments of every game. Link finally discovers the legendary Blade of Evil's Bane, and pulls it to symbolise the completion of his transformation into the hero. This time, he pulls the blade from the head of the Light Dragon, Zelda herself, 
The gravity of what she has done so that this sword could reach Link makes this moment so impactful. Zelda has given everything, and now the final battle falls on Link. Speaking of the final battle, Tears of the Kingdom's ending could well be the game at its absolute strongest. Like with Breath of the Wild, the ending of the game can be accessed without completing any of the main quests. Ganondorf lurks deep below Hyrule Castle, even deeper into the tunnels in which he was first discovered. So, in order to end the game, Link must come full circle, and descend into the same forgotten foundations he had with Zelda in the opening. Now, he can uncover murals that were obscured during the intro, showing Zelda accompanying Raru and the Sages, and her transformation into the Light Dragon. This shows that her journey was part of a closed loop, like the game's logo, the story has come full circle, and will end where it began. The fight against Ganondorf is the game's true final test, a multi-phase showdown against an opponent who is every bit as skilled as Link. Ganondorf uses a bow, a spear, a club, and a sword, can summon phantom clones or projectiles of dark magic, and can even flurry rush, using Link's signature technique against him. It's one of my favourite final boss battles in the Zelda series, but it isn't this game's last. The Demon Dragon serves the same role as Breath of the Wild's Dark Beast Ganon, more of a cinematic than an actual fight. The dragon is not a difficult fight whatsoever, but it's definitely more involved than its predecessor, and succeeds in being a jaw-dropping set piece to close out the game. Here, in Hyrule Skies, all three parts of the classic Zelda trio duke it out. The Dragon of Light and the Dragon of Darkness duel, with Link between them. With the Master Sword restored by Zelda, Link is able to destroy Ganondorf for good. The spirits of King Raru and Queen Sonya appear, and channel their own powers through Link. The Irreversible is reversed, and the Light Dragon vanishes, leaving Zelda in its place. This leads to the game's emotional climax. Tears of the Kingdom had begun with Link failing to catch Zelda. He missed her hand, and she fell into the past. He won't miss again. This final catch could well have been a cutscene, but giving the player control of Link here is a stroke of genius, and serves to connect the player to the story. I teared up the first time I reached this point. Link and Zelda's relationship is strong enough to give this moment real weight, and make the player want to save her. It's the perfect way to end the game, and, in retrospect, it couldn't have ended any other way. The majority of Tears of the Kingdom's story is really cool, a time travel loop which shows the very beginning and the very end of Ganondorf's long war against the kingdom. There's clearly been so much of the classic Zelda charm poured into it, from the exceptional design of Raru, one of my new favourite characters in the series, to the heartbreaking sacrifice of one of the game's most beloved characters. It is a good story, but it's executed poorly. Despite the highs it reaches, I hardly ever felt like I was truly engaging with this story. It often feels that Link is a step removed from the game's events, rather than a central part of this world. Like with Breath of the Wild's memories, the dragon's tears can be done in any order. Whenever Link encounters one, he unlocks the cutscene specific to that glyph. This means that players will most likely unlock Zelda's story out of order. This wasn't much of a problem in Breath of the Wild. At the very beginning of the game, the player understands that Hyrule has fallen, and the spirit of King Rome outlines how this happened at the end of the tutorial section. This cutscene is an admittedly clunky way of giving the player all the context they need to begin to engage with the world itself. Recovering Link's memories adds depth to this story, but that's it. Each memory colours in one part of a story we already know the outline of. 
Tears of the Kingdom is structured differently. There's no lore dump from the spirit of Hyrule's old king at the end of the Great Sky Island, leaving the main story, the imprisoning war, a mystery. And piecing together Zelda's memories is essential to understand it. This in itself is a bit contrived. It's never explained why Raru's spirit chooses not to explain the imprisoning war to Link. Because he can't explain it in order for the story to work in the way the developers want it to. The main mysteries of the game's plot exist only because Raru chooses not to explain them here, which is a very unsatisfying way to tell a story. This puts a lot more stress on the memory style of delivery than was the case in the previous game. They're still as non-linear and as open as before, but now they're far less optional. Because the main story is delivered this way, it's possible to interact with it in the wrong way. The Master Sword geoglyph, found on the slopes of Death Mountain, unlocks the A Master Sword Through Time cutscene, for example, in which Minoru explains that draconification is the only way for Zelda to carry the sword to the present day. This can be encountered at any time, and likely will be found relatively early, given its placement on the slopes of Death Mountain, but it spoils the story's main twist, making what has happened to Zelda obvious. Link uncovering his own memories in Breath of the Wild didn't change anything in the present. Remembering more details surrounding the Great Calamity doesn't affect anything about the present day. Link is an amnesiac, and has been asleep for a century, so the game's characters always know more about the story than the player does. This keeps the story of the Great Calamity interesting right up until the very end of the game. The player is always a step behind, desperate to uncover more about the story of this world. But Link uncovering Zelda's memories in Tears of the Kingdom absolutely should change how he interacts with characters in the present. All of Hyrule is frantically searching for their missing princess and getting duped by Ganondorf's phantom, and Link can do nothing to change this. No matter how much he learns about Zelda's journey, he has no way to tell people about it. The world and the setting remain static despite the player probably solving the main mystery very early on. The end result is incredibly frustrating. It becomes obvious where Zelda is almost immediately, and the player will figure out that the Zelda in the present is Ganondorf's puppet as soon as they find the memory near Luralin Village. The player ends up knowing far more about the story than any of the world's characters, but is forced to humour them in their charade constantly being fooled by puppet Zelda and searching for a princess they will never find. The only exception to this non-linearity is the final memory, which only becomes available after all of the others have been unlocked. The Light Dragon appears and cries a final tear, allowing Link to see her sacrifice and her transformation. But even unlocking this memory changes nothing in the present, Link now has seen Zelda transform into the Light Dragon with his own eyes, but he can't tell anyone about it. Only Impa, who mumbles something about trying to turn her back, but never does anything about it. Like with most of my criticisms of this game, Tears of the Kingdom's story suffers because of the game's complete freedom. Breath of the Wild's story was designed to fit this open-air style, uncovering how a nation collapsed while exploring what remained. Tears of the Kingdom's story isn't designed this way. It tries to break up a more conventional narrative and scatter it around an open world, but this just doesn't work. Again, the broad strokes of the story are excellent, but the way it is told severely hinders it. We never get enough detail, the player feels completely separate from the main narrative, like Link's journey is the epilogue to a greater quest we never get to take part in. This was true of Breath of the Wild too, of course, but with one major difference. Its story is supported by the way the game is designed. 
Uncovering the details of Hyrule's fall is the point. Every crumbling ruin, every tiny town sheltered away in the wilderness, and Hyrule Castle itself, Ground Zero, where the scars of the Calamity are deepest, all tell the game's story in ways that the memories couldn't, and support the game's deliberately broken narrative. Environmental storytelling is what does most of the heavy lifting here. The closer the player looks, and the more they think about this world and its ruins, the more the story of the Great Calamity comes to life. The world is designed to tell its own story. By exploring it, Link can decipher the mysteries of the past outside of the game's main memories and quests. Tears of the Kingdom doesn't have this luxury. The vast majority of its world is the same Hyrule as before. The ruins of Akala Citadel, Hyrule Castle, the Great Plateau, Fort Hateno don't do anything to deepen our understanding of the sequel's story. And the areas that are new, for the most part, lack any of the masterful environmental storytelling of the prequel. The Great Sky Island has the most story of any of them. It was known as the Garden of Time during the time of King Raru, a peaceful, tranquil grove in the shadow of the ancient Temple of Time. We're told by the construct atop this temple that the entire Great Sky Island was once found on the surface which we see in Zelda's memories. This ancient Temple of Time is found in the same place as the newer, Hyrulean Temple of Time in the present. This means that the Great Sky Island was once in roughly the same place as the Great Plateau, which we know was the heart of Raru's kingdom, and the site of his Hyrule Castle. Now, the Garden of Time is in ruins. We see the foundations of what could have been houses or abbeys. There's a melancholic feeling here, one of the decaying ruin of something majestic, of glory days that are now gone, never to return. The Temple of Time's bell, one which once dictated the daily lives of Raru's people, now echoes across an empty plateau, heard only by the constructs which live on without their masters. The Great Sky Island having this backstory gives deeper meaning to the areas Link explores, and connects him with Hyrule's history. Because we know what this place once was, it allows us to theorise and wonder about the ruins that remain. This stone arch might have been the gate to the Garden of Time, or these ruined buildings might have been homes for servants or priests who worked in the temple. But the same can't be said for the other Sky Islands. Forge Island was, well, a forge. The Thunderhead Isles were probably designed as an entrance to the Spirit Temple. But the vast majority of Sky Islands lack anything interesting whatsoever. Most are incredibly similar ruins of nondescript Zonai buildings, islands designed around accessing a shrine with absolutely nothing in the way of story. And the same's true for the depths. Again, there are broad strokes here. We can tell from the abandoned mines that the Zonai used the depths to gather Zonite, and stations for vehicle parts show how these ancient people once traversed this underground land. But there's nothing deeper than this. Like the Sky Islands above, the structures in the depths are too repetitive and too mundane to act as a crutch for the game's story, like the ruins of Hyrule on the surface did before. The exception to this is the Yiga clan hideouts. Master Koga was defeated by Link during Breath of the Wild after falling down a seemingly bottomless pit. This pit did have a bottom, though. Koga fell into the depths. He had accidentally found an entire new world, and so, in the years between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, his followers have been exploring the depths, experimenting with ancient Zonai machinery and building base camps in the darkness. Each hideout features a journal of notes the Yiga expeditionaries have made about their time in the depths. These range from funny, like how one writer hopes to find shadow bananas in the Farren depths, to genuinely disturbing, like how bargainer statues have been stealing their souls. 
Having a bit of story to the Yiga hideouts immediately makes them more characterful than the countless similar Zonai ruins, and so much more memorable. But overall, Tears of the Kingdom's world building feels incredibly shallow in comparison to Breath of the Wild. The actual story of the game takes place in the distant past just the same as before, but it isn't supported in the same way by the world itself, which I think is one of the game's biggest detriments. Aonuma claimed that they wanted to create a world that players can interpret in their own way, which oftentimes has been the principle for world building all throughout the series. Zelda stories are always vague and open for interpretation, but all have had rich themes that immerse players into their worlds. The mystery of Hyrule's fall, and an unseen world to explore, are what makes Breath of the Wild so magical. But Tears of the Kingdom's mystery of Zelda's whereabouts and the imprisoning war aren't enough to do the same. Previous Zelda games were set in a somewhat loosely connected timeline, beginning with Skyward Sword and forking with Ocarina of Time into three alternate branches. The Zelda timeline has always been a controversial topic. Some fans believe that it never really mattered, and that Nintendo only published it to appease the fanbase and theory community. But regardless of your opinions on an overarching timeline connecting all games, it's inarguable that many of them are indeed linked. Ocarina of Time is explicitly followed by The Wind Waker, which in turn is followed by Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, but Ocarina is also explicitly followed by Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess in an alternate version of events. Breath of the Wild was something of a soft reboot for the Zelda series. Instead of pinning it to one of the three established timeline branches, it was instead set so far in the future that it didn't really matter. Everything that came before it was consigned to a period known as the Era of Myth. And this decision worked well for the setting of Breath of the Wild, an ancient, mysterious kingdom of Hyrule, now broken and crumbling into ruin. The remnants of landmarks from the previous Zelda games could be found scattered across the wilderness. The Temple of Time and Lon Lon Ranch from Ocarina of Time, the Springs from Skyward Sword. The game distanced itself from other Zelda games, but still felt connected to them. This was still the same universe we knew and loved. Tears of the Kingdom, though, explores the founding of this kingdom of Hyrule, showing us its first king and queen, Raru and Sonya. This clashes with established Zelda lore, and treads on the toes of previous games, mainly Ocarina of Time, by introducing another, different Ganondorf earlier in the timeline. The game's director, Hidemaru Fujibayashi, has stated that the game's connection to previous titles has been left deliberately vague, but suggests that this Kingdom of Hyrule could instead be another Hyrule, founded long after the original had fallen and been forgotten. Meaning that Zelda didn't travel back to before Ocarina of Time, but to a time that was still eons after every other game. This is a perfectly reasonable idea, and makes sense of a lot of Tears of the Kingdom's story, but it feels unnecessary and somewhat hollow. This would completely sever both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom from the games that came before. This Hyrule isn't the one we know, it's something completely new, and is worse off for it. Even without directly referencing previous Zelda games, Breath of the Wild was able to benefit from their world building. Just by taking place in the same Hyrule, it made the game all the more magical. Zelda games don't need to constantly reference each other. They don't need to have concrete placements on a timeline. But they don't need to be islands. They can lean on the stories of the games that came before them, on the lore and the world building the series has become known for, and I'd argue that this is one of these games' major strengths. Tears of the Kingdom doesn't just ignore the lore from previous Zelda games, it seems to ignore its own prequel. 
Important characters from Breath of the Wild don't recognize Link, and the sequel offers no explanation at all for many of the changes to Hyrule. For example, the Sheikah technology that was so prevalent in Breath of the Wild has all vanished. The Shrine of Resurrection, the Sheikah Towers, the Shrines, the Guardians, and the Divine Beasts have disappeared entirely, and are never mentioned by anyone. Fujibayashi offered his own explanation for this, claiming that they simply vanished, but nobody knows why. This is such an underwhelming answer. Of course, having this explained wouldn't affect the game in a major way, but this is a prime example of the lack of care for world building and deeper storytelling in Tears of the Kingdom. Another example, Zelda's draconification is set up as an irreversible sacrifice. Minoru warns that to become an immortal dragon is to lose oneself, and Zelda says that she will be forever changed. Yet, at the end of the game, this transformation is reversed. Thematically, it makes complete sense for Link, guided by the spirits of those who had become like parents to Zelda, to undo the draconification. But how this happens is never explained. Minoru believes that it was because of Raru and Sonya channeling their powers through Link, but admits that it's only a theory. Again, I understand the benefits of leaving some story elements vague, but if something is set up with strict rules, like a permanent transformation, you can't undo it without explaining why, or else it just feels cheap and unsatisfying. This moment stands out in particular because it undoes the main event of the game's story. At the end of Tears of the Kingdom, not much has changed. Even Link's damaged right arm is somehow restored. All of the events of Tears of the Kingdom have been resolved, and the story ends in a similar place to Breath of the Wild, which leaves the sequel feeling quite unnecessary. It's debatable whether or not making Zelda's transformation permanent would have done justice to her character and her story arc, but it's inarguable that it would have made the game's story have a much stronger impact. A certain lack of clarity plagues Tears of the Kingdom's world and story. The history and motivations of Ganondorf are left unsaid, Minoru's plan to awaken via a construct in the present makes little sense, and the lore surrounding the elevation of the Sky Islands is messy and underwhelming. Again, while the story's main ideas are great, the execution is where it falls short. Breath of the Wild also had a sparse main story, but often, the questions the player asked had answers implied or told explicitly by side characters or the environment itself. The more the player thought about this world, the more it made sense. But the inverse is true in the sequel. The more you think about the world of Tears of the Kingdom, the more the illusion shatters. Overall, Tears of the Kingdom's story sits in a strange place. On paper, it's excellent. The ominous opening sequence below Hyrule Castle, the separation of our protagonists, and their isolated quests in past and present eras, and the bombastic conclusion, where all elements come together for an explosive finish. Zelda finding herself stuck in the distant past is a fantastic concept and the sacrifice she makes for her kingdom, and her knight, will be remembered as one of the most iconic story moments in the whole series. On my channel, I've got a three-part series telling the story of Tears of the Kingdom from start to finish, compiling the narrative in the proper order and trying to make sense of the game's events and lore. And putting this together really did make me appreciate the strengths of the game's plot. The ideas presented here are fantastic, and the story of the Imprisoning War is one of the darkest, most epic events in the Zelda series. But like with so much else in this game, the story suffers from the reuse of Breath of the Wild's world and from the complete freedom afforded to the player. This just isn't a story that works in this open format.
If the player was guided through the plot like in classic 3D Zelda games, then my opinion would likely be completely different. The story should be the skeleton supporting the gameplay, a foundation to build Link's quest on, to give meaning and purpose to his adventure. But Tears of the Kingdom's story is so separate from the main adventure that it feels like it's stuck on to the game, rather than baked into it. While there absolutely are highlights, and the core concepts explored are truly excellent, the story remains my biggest disappointment with Tears of the Kingdom. It's taken a lot of time to properly organise my thoughts on Tears of the Kingdom. It's not an easy game to review. If it was just a terrible flop, it would be easy to dismantle and forget about, to not care at all and just to move on. And if it was perfect, I could gush about it forever like I do with games like Ocarina of Time and The Wind Waker. But Tears of the Kingdom is neither of those things. It's somewhere in the middle. It's brilliant and it's underwhelming. A truly disappointing masterpiece. In so many ways, Tears of the Kingdom is the perfect Zelda game. It's the culmination of so many years of excellent titles. But it's because of its extraordinary heights that its flaws stand out like ropes hitching a hot air balloon to the ground, preventing it from truly flying. My opinion on Tears of the Kingdom is inextricably tied to my love of the series as a whole, and the prestige of The Legend of Zelda. Zelda fans are truly spoiled with some of the greatest games ever made. Zelda 1, A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild are all names which could reasonably be considered for the title of most influential game of all time. So while some of my disappointment with Tears of the Kingdom can be fairly attributed to my own high expectations, I don't think that they were unreasonable. Breath of the Wild was infuriatingly close to perfection for me, if it only included better dungeons and a more involved story. Tears of the Kingdom had the chance to correct these shortcomings, to show what Zelda could be in an open-air format. But the game unashamedly doubles down on absolutely everything about Breath of the Wild. Where it excels, it stands completely above everything else. Tears of the Kingdom is a titan, a masterpiece, a true marvel of game design. I love this game, I've played it from start to finish over and over this past year, and will continue to do so over the next. But it isn't what I hoped it would be, what it could have been. It's a titan because it stands on the shoulders of Breath of the Wild because it's an expanded version of one of the best and most influential games Nintendo have ever produced. The time between the final DLC pack for Breath of the Wild, The Champion's Ballad, and Tears of the Kingdom's launch was five and a half years. It's not clear to what extent the 2020 pandemic impacted this game's development, it's certain that it will have slowed it down at least somewhat, but this still leaves multiple years of work. The game's delay into 2023 was apparently because of Zonai devices, and the game's physics system, and it's clear that a monumental amount of time and effort went into perfecting these systems. And they are perfect. Tears of the Kingdom as a whole is a technical marvel. With the exception of a very occasionally unreliable frame rate, the game runs flawlessly on the Switch which is some kind of miracle. But this brilliance comes at the cost of the game's content. Fujibayashi has said that the depths layout were made in a surprisingly short period of time by simply inverting the terrain of Hyrule, the Sky Islands were drastically simplified, and the dungeons were short and underwhelming. Nine months after release, I wonder if the pursuit of Miyamoto's original dream was worth sacrificing so much of the spirit of the classic Zelda games. Leading up to the game's release, and especially after the announcement of the game's higher price tag, people started to call the game $70 DLC. 
As in, this wasn't truly a new Zelda game, just a giant expansion pack for Breath of the Wild. And now that the game's released, it's clear that, unfortunately, they were right. It's the biggest, greatest expansion pack ever, but it is just that. An expansion, not a sequel. The question of where the Zelda series will go from here is one nobody can answer. Recent interviews with the series developers have confirmed that, yes, the open-air format seen in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom will continue to be the blueprint for the 3D games. Aonuma comments that the older games feel restrictive, and wonders why fans would prefer to see more traditional elements reintroduced. But as Tears of the Kingdom shows us, sometimes restriction is good. Restriction breeds creativity, and stops you taking unbounded freedom for granted. I know I'm not alone in believing that a game like Tears of the Kingdom, combined with classic Zelda staples like giant, themed dungeons, item progression, and a linear, gripping story would be the best possible outcome. I really do think that this could work, and that it would be the best Zelda experience yet. And I don't think that this is unreasonable to expect, either. The Zelda team always listens to criticism, and adjusts the trajectory of their development. Twilight Princess was famously a reaction to the criticism of the Wind Waker's overly cartoonish art style, and Breath of the Wild was a reaction to criticism of Skyward Sword's linearity. Tears of the Kingdom feels like a response to the massive success of its predecessor. Breath of the Wild is, by far, the most successful Zelda game to date, and so Tears of the Kingdom attempts to recreate its magic. And this sequel sold monstrously well at launch, but these sales have slowed since, and the once overwhelmingly positive reception has given way to a more conflicted general consensus on the game. Perhaps the Zelda team will acknowledge the criticism of Tears of the Kingdom, and whatever's next will show a response to this game's shortcomings. Either way, I'm incredibly excited for what's next. With confirmation that we're done with Breath of the Wild's version of Hyrule, it means we're visiting new lands next. Either a reimagined new Hyrule, or somewhere else entirely. With Tears of the Kingdom as a foundation to build upon, I think the future of the series is incredibly bright. Thank you so much for watching this video, and listening to me waffle about Tears of the Kingdom for hours. Please let me know your thoughts on the game in the comments. Do you agree with my takes, or do you feel differently? I'm really interested to hear your opinions. If you like this video, leave a like, or consider subscribing if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.